would you say is the difference between your fan base around other parts of the world and the UK? Because obviously I feel like you have a little bit of a hometown advantage here when it comes to the fans. Um, yeah, I, I think I think depending like on the size of the Comic Con, I, uh, like the one in Germany, we did a Vikings Con recently. That was massive. Um, but I obviously prefer being back in the UK. Of course, <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's it's crazy how um, that m crazy Norse show that we did. Not even I'm not even sure if we're allowed to mention its name. Um, how it's got fans all over the world, and some, some in places where you'd never expect it. But I think what's so special about it is that the, the lineage really did, they really did travel halfway across the world. So there is places where you'd never imagine it to be, and people are going, you know, in Canada, it's massive. And, but um, I love coming back here to this side of the world. I moved over to Los Angeles in the middle of COVID, which was kind of like... That'd be a good idea, Clive. Let's move to the, one of the most expensive cities in the world, and then everything was locked down and closed. Um, so now I've been too long away from my, my hometown and my home country, so it's great to be back. What do you miss when you're away? Because with all due respect to Los Angeles and In-N-Out Burger, I'm sure there's some things that you miss, whether it be food or silly things. We, were in, we, we, we traveled down to Birmingham to see some family. And uh, we got off of the train in Birmingham and we were just walking out of Birmingham New Street Station and it smelled of chip fat. It was obviously some fish and chip shop or something, but it was the smell of chip fat. We both went, home. home. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Yeah, you do miss some silly things when you're traveling. In your travels, do you guys get to actually go out and see anything, anything historical? Or do you have time to actually have fun and see part of the city when you're traveling? Well, most of the time we try and get... We try and go early, so we have a few days, so that we're not too jet lagged. Or we just depend, like we try and stay on for a couple of days, so we can go traveling around and do all the tourist stuff. Let me try to. For fear of oversharing. Oh, <laughs> here we go. Um, we we didn't work together in, in the show that we were both in, and we met at a comic con in Germany. Um, and what was interesting for the first year of us being together is that we had a long distance relationship, and we would go to do comic cons, sign autographs, meet the fans, but we try and extend it a little bit so we could spend more time together. So we've been able to kind of go around Europe and see lots of different kind of historical destinations rather than just getting in and out for a con. Thanks to you guys, thanks to the fans, I ended up with a future wife. <laughs> oh, can we get in a collective, Oh. You hear that, guys? Comic-Con brings people together. You never know who you're going to meet at Comic-Con, by the way, so... Do you know, that's a good point. I remember <laughs> being at San Diego Comic-Con when we first did uh, the, the, the North show. And, um, <laughs> and I remember seeing, and it, it was... It was it, my first day at Comic-Con, I saw... It was when The Dark Knight was out, I think, because there, was, there were loads of guys dressed as the Joker's hench henchmen in the street getting arrested for real by the, 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 by the police. And it was such a surreal thing because they were all going, put the bat, the bat! And they, were, and they were taking it really seriously, but they were really getting arrested. Then I remember going to a, um, a, a bus stop and there was like five different Captain Americas waiting for the bus. And then I saw Chewbacca holding hands with Supergirl. So and, they, and I think they just met at this Comic Con and they found love and it was really sweet. And I mean this, it's not, I'm, I meant it's like, I was actually, it was a really endearing moment. It was a, the size difference was very funny. But that I was just imagining they've come to Comic Con, they've found, they've like-minded interests and they've fallen in love. Little did I know that I was going to be that same person being at a Comic Con and falling in love. Um, but yeah, it's, Comic Cons bring people together. We're all here for the reason, whether it's a show or whatever. And, and I think what we create here, whether you're an actor giving something back to fans or the fans coming, because I definitely get something from you guys. And, and then people that just meet because they have a like-minded interest. It's a very special experience, unlike any other you know, um, convention out there. You do meet the nicest people. Give yourselves a round of applause. It's a safe space, and like you said, we're all here for the same reason. Speaking of cosplay, though, we have, by the way, Manchester, your cosplay game is on point. I was up there watching. Hello, Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. Speaking of, looking delicious over there. What have you guys thought about the cosplay at this particular Comic-Con, or what are some of your favorite cosplay artists that you've seen around the world? Well, I saw someone today, he might even be here, there was a guy dressed as Thor, who looked like the perfect combination of Liam Hemsworth and Chris Hemsworth. And I'm like, you could make a killing. 
You, know, you can just switch between the Hunger Games and Thor. Um, I don't know if you're out there. That's a compliment. I thought you looked great as Thor. And he had the, he had the moves down and the poses. Good, good on you. Lucy, have you seen any cosplay that strikes your fancy here? Other than Mr. Stay Puffed, of course. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's really taking my attention right now, I'll be honest. Where were we the other day? Were we in Telford when we saw the... Um, there, was this, there was a girl and she was dressed up as a unicorn, but what she'd done is she had, like... It was... She'd, like, she'd done the whole thing at the front, like, she'd done her hair and, like, she got this, like, multicolored rainbow hairstyle. And then she'd actually made the back of the horse attached to the back of her, and then she was on wheels, and she was just covered in like diamantes, and she looked amazing. I've actually got a picture on my phone that I sent to my niece. She looks amazing. There was a, a young lady here earlier that I overheard. She spent 120 hours on her outfit. So the effort that you guys and the passion you put into the cosplay is really, really commendable. But um, speaking of cosplay, we have a lot of people here that are not only into cosplay, they're into the industry, whether it be acting, filmmaking, directing. Um, what advice would you give to someone that wants to get into the acting business or the entertainment business? I would always, I live by something which is just consistency is key. <laughs> If you are consistent and you work hard and you continue to just keep going, even when you get rejected, you're always going to end up doing it. Does that make sense? And then eventually, I always think it does so far, it works out. Yeah. Um, Brian Cranston put it best. Oh, I remember I actually watched his advice on acting and, and he was like, well, do you know what? You get... You don't get paid to do the acting job. You do that bit for free. You, you get paid for all the rejection, all the auditions, all the kind of having to stick with it, you know, trying to find your know, feast and famine, trying to find ends meet. That's what you get paid for, the publicity, the, you know, but you actually do the job for free. But then what he also goes on to do is he said most actors get really annoyed when they don't get a job. They go to an audition and they get really let down. They're like, oh, that guy got it. Why is he better than me? And it's not about whether someone's better than you or not, there's, there's interesting and there's more interesting and it depends who's watching that performance, what the director wants from it. But what his advice was is, even the audition is your performance. You go to the audition, it might last 15 minutes, it might last two minutes, but if it's a two minute audition, that's your one night only performance of that character. You give two minutes and that's your audience, four people in the room, and you go home and you go, oh, I just performed my, my two minute performance and you move on with your life. Whereas so many actors get hung up on, oh, why didn't I get it? What was wrong? There's nothing wrong with you at all. But if you see everything as of the performance, because I personally really enjoy the doing of it. And it's been a very weird trans um, transition for me going from, from TV and film, because I went to drama school and all I ever wanted to do was theater. And the whole point of theater is it's different every night. And I get off on that. I, get, I love the idea of nailing it one night, but then there's always something you could make better. And then sometimes you come off stage and you, you might as well have pissed on the audience and ruined it and walked out and you hate it. And you, but then the tomorrow, you've always got tomorrow and you're always trying to be better. Um, and then it's gone. Once that show's gone, you move on. And in TV, it's, it seems to be a lot of actors are more interested in what comes afterwards, the fame or the premiere. And, the, you know, and I, it doesn't, I don't get that. I get the doing of it, but in TV, you move on every day and you don't get a chance to kind of have another go and another go. And it's a very strange, th strange art form, a very two different art forms. Um, I've kind of gone off on a tangent, but uh, everything is the performance. Everything you do, you have to enjoy. Enjoy the doing of it rather than what comes after. No, we're here for the tangents. We love the storytelling, so thank you for that behind-the-scenes look. But you did mention the fame. I have to wonder how that's affected you. Also, as a couple how you deal with sort of the fame, and was it surprising to you that things that you've done in your career have gotten you to this point in front of all these adoring fans? I don't, I don't really think about it, <laughs> to be honest. I don't, um, I think maybe Clyde probably gets more attention than I do, don't you? <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's, it's all been, it's a strange one, isn't it? Because when you come to a Comic-Con, I've got actors who go, oh my God, I've been invited to a Comic-Con, it's my worst nightmare. And I don't understand, because I actually think it's, one, it's a great way for me to meet people and say thank you, because Vikings got, well, six seasons, 90-something episodes, 
And that wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for the amount of people watching it every year, because every season we have to wait by our phones for months on end until they pick it up for another season. And that's all dependent on the ratings, the advertisement sales, all that kind of stuff. So if we didn't have enough of you guys watching it, we wouldn't have been able to get to where we did with our characters. So I suppose this is me indirectly saying thank you now. Um, so Comic Cons are important to me, but it's also everybody's here because, like, not everybody knows about the shows I've been in, but everyone hopefully here is here because they like the show I'm in. And it's, you know, it's, it's a kind of an easy crowd. Um, but I've also had people come up to me at the airport and go, you're that guy, yeah, you're that guy, because they've seen someone take a photo with me, and I go, yeah, I am, and they go, no, you're not, and then walk off, and then, or people take your picture, and just because they want your picture taken, and they don't know who you are. <laughs> so, you're only famous if the people have seen the shows you're in. You know, it doesn't matter if you're Tom Cruise, if you're sitting with that one guy that's never heard of Tom Cruise, you're not famous, he's not famous. Um, but Comic Cons, I always think, is a great crowd, because we're all here for, the shows we love, and, and I geek out. I mean, if Viggo Mortensen was here right now, I'd be, I'd be queuing all day to get his autograph. I'm one of you guys, I get it, and I love it. And we really appreciate that, and it's so, yes, round of applause. And she applauded when you said thank you, too, which was very sweet. Um, that was my next question. So we love to hear that you guys are also fans of certain things, whether it be you know the Star Wars franchise or Harry Potter or what have you. When you've been at a Comic-Con, it could be today, or it could be any Comic-Con you've done, who have you fangirled or fanboyed over? Have you met Vigo, by the way? You did mention him oh, specifically, not yet. I'm sure he's watching this. We went to New Zealand, and it was funny, because we were in New Zealand, and they obviously filmed The Lord of the Rings out there, and I'm saying, oh, I'd love to meet Vigo, and nearly everybody in New Zealand, oh, I met you, I met Vigo, <laughs> and you're like, every, was, he's like, oh, it's the old news, and I was, I was so excited. But yeah, I really would, I would lose my shit <laughs> if I met him. I'm a massive Lord of the Rings fan. And my dichotomy is that I, if you ask me any character I'd love to play, I've got a couple, but Aragorn would be one of them. But my dichotomy is I don't think, I know I can't play it better than him. So it's kind of like, I'll choose the one role I, can't, I don't think I'd be able to do. His um, understudy, perhaps, you know? The other one is Clancy Brown. I love the Kurgan in Highlander. Actually, if I was to Comic Con, a com co cosplay, I think that's what I'd choose to do. I'd love to dress up as a Kurgan. Because I think it would be my way of auditioning for it if they remade it. There's always tomorrow. You could do cosplay, and we can put you in the cosplay masquerade. Yeah. There's money on the line. It's a whole thing. To say. <laughs> See? It's better to burn out <laughs> than to fade away. Lucy, have you met anybody at a Comic Con that you admired from acting or any other sort of genre? I'm trying to think. I I always get, I always, I'm a bit rubbish at questions sometimes on the spot because suddenly my mind goes blank. She does a brilliant Gollum. I, I actually do. <laughs> my, well, is it Gollum or, yeah, it's Gollum. How's it going? Schmeagol. <laughs> Not right now. Oh. See you with. Oh, I'm not very good under pressure, guys. <laughs> Okay, she's at the table over there. We can ask her later today. Oh, yeah, I'll be better over there. It's a bit bad. So you could do it once right now, or you're going to have to do it 40 times yeah. down there. I hate you. Maybe just, maybe just say hello to Manchester as Gollum. What did you say? As, what did you say? Say hello to the crowd as Gollum, perhaps. Um, we'll make it easy. Just trying to, I'm trying to think. Um, just channeling. I'm channeling. Hang on a second. Bear with me. I'm trying, like, my mind's gone blank. I'm trying to remember what Gollum says. You got this, you got this. Um, Facts to beats. <laughs> what does Gollum say again? I've lost it. Schmeagol. Schmeagol. Uh, Facts to beats, he knows. He knows. Yes. I liked the giggling Gollum version. That's the most gorgeous version of Gollum I've ever seen. Hashtag giggling Gollum, now trending. Well guys, we'll take a few fan questions if that's okay with you, but as we mentioned, we have a microphone right here. We're only gonna take a few, and if you don't mind, we're gonna have it not specific to a specific show or role, but make it fun and as random as you can, and we'll do our best. Uh, hi. Hello. Um, so my question is for both of you. Um, I know you're like actors and actresses and that. What got you in? What got you into acting? Like, what was your driving motivation towards acting? Great question. 
Um, I've been doing it for a very long time, since I was really young. Um, I was talking to somebody about this the other day, and I actually think, uh, as a kid, I had two older brothers, and I think I always really, I was always into dancing and singing and acting and all that sort of thing. Um, but I used to spend quite a lot of time on my own, in my own imagination, and I think that, I think, I think that's probably what channeled it. Like, I found it very easy to get lost in my imagination. Yeah. Um, and I think that's probably where it started, of like playing different characters and the idea of becoming somebody else. Um, I find it a lot easier to do that than probably stand up here and be myself. <laughs> you know, it's quite nerve wracking. Um, yeah, for me. What about you? Um, it's, it's a weird one because it starts, it's usually, uh, it, it does, the acting bug as a kid usually starts as a kind of desire to show off. And then it changes for the ones that are good. The ones that aren't very good, it tends to just stay that and, and it pitters out. But I don't know. My mum my mum was diagnosed with, with an illness um, and she decided to go back to, to college and do a, a performing arts degree. So she wanted to work with... Um, the drama therapy with Down syndrome kids. Um, it was kind of like a, a, an early midlife crisis for my mum, and she said, what have I always wanted to do? And she'd always been like that kind of thespian on the wings. Um, and I just, I was, I was the British champion in Muay Thai boxing. I wasn't interested in acting at all. I was interested in punching you in the face. Um, and I, I suppose at that age, when I was 16, 17, she was bringing home guys and girls that were university age, and she's the mature student. And, you know, they're obviously role models to me. They're older and they're kind of doing coursework and they're working on plays. And, and then my mum started taking me to, like, Irvin Welsh stuff. You know, like uh, the Marabou Stork Nightmares and train spotting, the theatre version and stuff. And I started to see theatre that wasn't just musical theatre, West Side Story, kind of. It was darker and it was, you know... And then I started going, oh, it's similar to Lucy. I was like... It was a way of playing somebody else, drawing attention away from myself. And... The reason why I started with that, the desire to show off, is because I always thought that was my weakness, that I wasn't a show off. And I went to drama school, and everyone was dancing on tables, singing fame, and you know, look at me, look at me, look at me. And, and I just thought I had to be more like them. And, it, and I really, I had friends at drama school, but I didn't fit in. And now I look back at those ones, and they're not really working, and I managed to make a career out of it, to, you know, touch wood. Um, that I'll carry on doing so, but it, that's what I figured out, that it was a desire to, to be somebody else, to draw attention away from myself. And that's what I think real acting is, is observation. And really, truly looking at someone and putting them up on the screen or on the stage as they are, without altering them. And the people that show off, they tend to put an extra 10% onto their person. So if I was to copy you, I would try and copy you exactly as you are. But there's a desire to let everybody know that I'm such a good person, I'm such a good copier, that I want you to all to see that I'm copying her. And that, that's when I say showing off. This is like an acting masterclass. Yes, for the applause. Great stories from you both. And this uh, young gentleman, Power Ranger, has a question as well. Well, this is a question for both of you. What was your favorite thing you acted in? Yeah, I did a little independent film called In Like Flynn. The film itself isn't very good. I'm not telling anyone to go out and <laughs> pay $3.99 and watch it on, on demand. But the character I played was a 55-year-old alcoholic sailor in Australia in the 1930s. Um, and it was just so much fun to play this character. He had imaginary friends. He was just really larger than life and it was just it was the most fun I've had transforming myself that I've ever had and you know, there's obviously the North show that was a longer version of that where you can you can build a character from the very beginning because I played that character in um, in Ireland from the age of 28 till the age of 64 I think the Duke of Normandy died at um, so it's very rare that you get to play a character where the studio will let you play it from in the older years. Usually they might cast another actor and get the older years with it, but they, they aged us up and they let us, so that's very rare. So that was, 
that's what I like. I like to be able to play a character and really develop them from, you know, from the inside out. And I, <laughs> I, I did a, a horror comedy sci-fi movie, which was as complex as it sounds. And basically the character that I played was very unlikable, uh, completely obsessed with herself. And eventually she turned into an alien. And uh, I basically got pregnant with aliens. Anyway, the whole thing was mad, um, but it was very challenging and a lot of fun. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And just uh, Doctor Who as well. That was yes. one of the, I did Doctor Who. I did three episodes a long time ago. That was a lot of fun to do. You know there's a lot of Doctor Who fans in the crowd right now, yes? Yes. Question from this gentleman. Hello there, uh, a question for Clive. So you're due to be playing Captain Titus in Space Marine 2 coming ahead, aren't you? I am. Indeed, yes. So with regards to obviously Henry Cavill working with Games Workshop for making a series, would that be something you would ever be interested in if he approached you? I would, there's a top secret thing I've been working on with Titus in, in an unknown network. <laughs> so hard. <laughs> um, it's called Secret Level. That's all I can say. It was top secret, but I get to play Titus in an animation, which is great. So, I mean, I mean, really, I think I am. I'm really tight with the Games Workshop guys. I love them. When I was, I grew up in Nottingham, just outside Nottingham. So I went to their head offices when I was younger. My brother used to work in a bar and he knew a lot of them. We went down. Um, I used to actually get, I used to get the, the figures, the, the metal version, because they don't do those anymore. And I used to paint them really badly. <laughs> I, I, I would obviously try the hardest I can, but there was a guy down in, um, in the marketplace who used to do it professionally from Games Workshop, and he'd sell each figure for like, I don't know, 20 pounds or something like that. It was way more than my pocket money. And I used to, <laughs> I used to buy one, I used to save a pocket. So I'd have this one amazing kind of like, I don't know, what was it, the Space Wolves? Um, uh, I, I, and um, I'd have this one amazing one, and then these awful ones that I'd painted. <laughs> He's just sitting on the So I'm, I'm really tight with them now, and I hopefully, if anything happens, I'm going to put my, my gauntlet in the thing, and I'm going to be like, you know, I am Titus now. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Mark Strong's too old, you see. He played him in the first game. I was but... going to wonder why he didn't reprise it, to be fair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Great question. We'll take these final two, and then we'll let them get back to the autograph area. Thank you, guys. Hello there. Hi, Clive. Hi, Lucy. Uh, yeah. I've had the good fortune of speaking to Clive before about your, your uh, acting past and stuff. My question is for you, Lucy. Um, what was the most interesting scene that you got to film in Vikings where you could pull from your, the conglomerate of your experiences and skills? What was your favorite thing to do in Vikings? Um, am I allowed to answer? What was your favorite thing to do in that unnamed show that you did? <laughs> so, I would say, so I, so I started in the profession as a professional dancer. Yeah. Um, and I was a singer for a while as well, so I've merged in. And there was, I remember coming back after a hiatus and suddenly reading in a script and being like, I'm dancing around a tomb, high on something, trying to re-impregnate myself with, you know, from a dead guy. Casual stuff. Oh, yeah, just <laughs> imagination, go. Um, and I think for me, that was, I loved it. It kind of creatively fulfilled every part of what I, what I like to do. It fulfilled everything for me. Movement's always been a massive part of my life. And um, I then was able to just move freely. And it, I filmed it over two days. And uh, it was amazing. And I it improvised basically all of it. And um, obviously, uh, like, I had to see where the cameras were and what angles and what looked best and all that sort of stuff. So we all worked work together and there was a lot of meetings prior, but that scene was nearly cut because the director said, I don't know how it's going to go. I don't know how we're actually going to make this good. And I said, just trust me. Yeah. I know yeah, what I'm yeah, doing. Yeah. And he yeah. was like, I still don't trust you. <laughs> um, so it took a while. And then once I gained his trust, I just said, let's just go for it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, for me, I think that was probably the... the the most enjoyable and creatively challenging and fulfilling yeah. scene for me. And I mean, you, you sell it. You completely sell the whole oh. mystical element and vibe of that stuff completely. Thank so, you. Well done, I no, thank you, that. well done. Thanks. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you so much. Yes. And our final question from this gentleman here. Hi, guys, you all right? Uh, my question's purely random about the unnamed North Shore. 
Um, what was the best thing you had to eat during filming the show and the worst thing you had to eat during the show? In, 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 the, in the unnamed North In show. the unnamed North show. Oh, do you want, do, do you want the, the thing is, they always, you get excited, because I love food, but I don't really enjoy eating a whole rack of lamb at 5.30 in the morning because it's meant to be in the evening and, you know, and you're a Viking, you've got to eat it all. And, and obviously they're like, roll the big guy, so we want to have a camera on Clive going and eat it all. That's one thing. And then later on in season three, when I went over to France, they were like, oh, this is going to be fun. Clive, you're going to get oysters and you're going to get all this fancy food. Well, this is going to be great. Eating oysters at like, you know, six in the morning, whatever, and, you know. But they didn't tell me that, obviously, the studio lights get really hot, so the oysters would be off within minutes. So what they did is they got shiitake mushrooms and soaked them in apple juice overnight, <laughs> put them in the oyster things. Didn't tell me. And, well, literally, it told me like 30 seconds before I'm about to pick them up and go... <laughs> and, like, yeah, it sucked back 12 oysters because he's a, a Norseman. Um, yeah, so it wasn't much fun <laughs> either end. But yeah, that was probably the weirdest thing. And then they do like, um, I remember the, the scene where Alex Ludwig and me they fight each other. Um, and my character's really, really drunk already. And you know, we're, we're fighting in the rain. They give you uh, organic apple juice. You know, the really, really cloudy apple juice. Not the kind of like the cheaper one that's easier to drink. The cloudy, th heavier. And mix it with non-alcoholic beer. So it's not only thick and it's cloudy and it's gassy, and I'm necking back pint after pint, and then going, because it, it went straight into the fight. So nearly every time, even though Alex is not really punching me, every time you're reacting, I thought I was going to throw up. And then there was a take as well, which is disgusting. Helen Shaver, our director, is going, go on, do it. Go on, throw up. Come on, roll, roll. And I'm literally on the floor going, <laughs> obviously trying to make it happen, going, what? This is not how I imagined this morning going, <laughs> with the director going, you're going to throw up, let's get it on camera. <laughs> so yeah, it's not all it's cracked out to be, all this eating on camera. Yeah, I mean, I, I, because my character from early on was basically watching everyone else as a slave, I learned pretty quickly to not eat and pretend, you know what I mean? Just have it in your hand and then just bake, like, pick up the pieces on the plate and sort of, you know, half do it. There was a job that I did where I had to, it was actually the job that I was just talking about, like with the aliens and all that sort of stuff, where I had to continually eat a massive plate of spaghetti bolognese, just over and over and over again. I mean, I did, I, I did about six or seven plates of like the full meal. Um, yeah, I was sick at one point, but uh, I I'd still eat a spaghetti bolognese. You're still a fan. Thank you. The glamorous world of acting, ladies and gentlemen. Apple, apple juice soaked oysters. <laughs> Hilarious. Well, guys, before we let you get over to the autograph and photo op area, because I know you guys want to meet and greet these lovely people, tell us what's going on next for you after Manchester, what you're looking forward to when you leave here. Well, I'm actually here till Friday, till next Friday, um, and just hanging out with my family. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, we've got a couple more Comic Cons coming in. Oh, we're doing a video um, game. And we are, we're doing some video games. We'll have to talk about video games, because they're actually great. The guys in the video games, they're not really affecting the actors at all. I feel very strongly over what's happening with SAG, just so you know as well. I think it's important that we, we do make a stand. Um, there's some networks out there that really do need to kind of like change their way of thinking, and, and they're just getting away with Blue Murder. But the video games, they pay well, they respect actors, and it's, a, it's an art form that's doing really well. And we're having so much fun. We're doing a game that um, is called Toxic Commando, that John Carpenter is, is behind. So who knows, eventually, if it does well and people like the game, John Carpenter might make it into a movie, which would be a lot of fun, because it's these four crazy mercenaries who don't get along. It's like Guardians of the Galaxy with zombies. It's kind of that kind of funny tongue-in-cheek with the John Carpenter kind of humor of these four guys that shouldn't be together but are stuck together trying to save the planet from these toxic monsters. Um, and it is. I mean, my character's in the vein of Chris Pratt, Star-Lord, and, and you're, yeah, and it is. It's, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun, and we're working on that. But they do, we're doing our, um, our likenesses as well. Facial so we recognition. Have, yeah. 
do all the dots on our face, and uh, when, when we speak, the characters move and talk like us, which is really exciting to watch. That's very cool. Something to look forward to. A lot of gamers in the crowd, I'm sure. You guys have been so much fun, and thank you for making so many memories with all of the fans here in Manchester. Manchester, please show your appreciation for Clive and Lucy. And don't miss your chance to get your autographs and photos with them. In